and we're specifically talking about polygamy. Uh -huh, polygamy. So I wanted you to help me out on, you know, how do you think I should approach the debate? Because he's quoting passages in the Old Testament that not only are showing that the the does people he believe in the, the New Testament, Testament age of polygamy, but also receive instructions. Yeah, but does he believe in the New Testament? Yes, he believes in the New Testament oh, then as well. Oh, that's simple. If he believes in the New Testament, he can't subjugate, he cannot subject the New Testament to the Old Testament because that shows that he's carnal-minded. Well, obviously he is. He's not a believer, and he doesn't know that the New Testament is the inspired lens through which we read the Old Testament and interpret it. And, for example, go to Matthew 19 and read for me verses 1 all the way to 9. Matthew 19 verses 1 to 9. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and he went into the region of Judah to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. So Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Jesus says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will be one flesh, become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, because it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immortality, immorality. Immorality. <laughs> hear what you just said? Except for yeah. sexual immortality. So you want sex to be never ending, everlasting? What's wrong? No. This is not Allah and the Quran and the Hoodies. <laughs> immorality. Yeah, okay, reread right. re it again. Um, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality yeah. and marries another woman commits adultery. Okay, now you see what they said. Like your black Hebrew Israelite, they appeal to Deuteronomy 24, verses 104, where Moses permitted a man to divorce his wife and set her apart. And here Jesus' own words is, this is not God's ideal standard. This is not what God wanted from the beginning. But God, in his love and in his patience, he condescended to meet his people where they're at, meet them at their level, and allowed what, in God's mind, was an evil that he tolerated nonetheless. Right? Yes. So why is he going to the Old Testament and assuming that the Old Testament is the standard when the standard is Jesus Christ? He's the living Torah, and he's the one who tells us what is God's ideal perfect standard for this age and the age to come? And Good he point. says, you notice, because of the stubbornness of your hearts, God allowed you to divorce your wives and remarry because of your stubborn, wicked hearts. But I'm telling you, that's not how it's going to be from now on because I'm here to now call you to a higher standard to bring you back and restore God's initial standard for marriage that he instituted at the beginning before sin entered the world. Got it. Got it. Definitely appreciate that. Do not let him su subject the New Testament to the Old Testament. It's other way around. The Old Testament subject to the New Testament. So then where does the New Testament say it's not polygyny, but it is monogamy? It is one male, one female. First Corinthians chapter seven, verses one of five. First Corinthians chapter seven, verses one of five. Okay. Chapter seven, verses one of five. I'm there now. It says, "Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but since." immorality is occurring each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband the husband should fulfill his 
Male duties to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. Now let's break that down. Each mm -hmm. man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. So you ask him, you say, can a woman have more than one husband? And what is he going to tell you? No, right? He's going to say no. Of course. But then he's stuck because Paul says, just like the woman should have her own husband, singular, the man should have his own wife, singular. He doesn't say a man can have his own wives and the woman can have her own husband. One wife for a man, one husband for a woman. It's reciprocal. And that's why he then says a man is obligated to satisfy his wife's sexual needs just like she's obligated to satisfy his sexual needs. Now continue. All right. And it goes on to say... Um... The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Why, why doesn't he say wives? Uh, because it's because of one wife, Paul, is the context is specifically one wife, one okay, husband. So you catch what he's saying here. And notice how fair... The Bible is, how equitable the Bible is. And look at how the Bible honors women, unlike the trash called the Quran and other religions and cultures. Notice it says, a man's body belongs to his wife. She has rights over his body, like her body belongs to the husband. It's equal. She owns your body, you own her body. Just like she can't deny you sexual pleasure, you can't deny her because she owns your body just as much as you own hers. Talk about beautiful, fair instructions, honoring women, dignifying women, and not subjugating them to be a floor mat for the man. Now you read all the yep. way to five? Yep, and uh, five goes on to say, do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Goes on to say, no, you can six. stop right there in five. Now you understand what he's saying. Mm -hmm. So you cannot deny your wife her sexual needs and satisfaction. You'd be sinning against God, and likewise. So, ladies, listen. The Bible says you married women, because this is sadly common. Some married women punish their husbands by refusing to have sex with them causing them to burn and lust, and then opening a door for satanic temptation where they become ensnared to pornography or other things, which they'll be held accountable for, but you will share in their guilt. So listen up, ladies. Paul is saying you better not use your body as a weapon to punish your husbands. And listen up, men. It's not just about you being satisfied in the bed. You better make sure she's satisfied fully and completely because she has just as much rights and ownership over your body as you do over her. If husbands and wives were to honor the scriptures, marriages would be a taste of heaven on earth. But sadly, we have even professing Christians who use sex as a weapon, weaponize their bodies to punish their spouses, opening a door for immorality and entanglement to sexual perversions. May God save us from that. But here he says, if the husband and wife mutually agree to refrain from sex for a short period in order to devote themselves to prayer and fasting, amen. But don't prolong it. Mm. Because wow. it defeats the purpose. So let's say you and your wife decide we're not going to have sex for six months. That's too long. Then you're going to start burning with lust. You're going to now have lustful desires, thereby nullifying your acts of devotion. In other words, the point of prayer and fasting is to a enter a state of purity, a state of righteousness, of holiness, so you can become holier and more pure and less carnal, less sinful. But as you prolong intimacy, your mind then becomes occupied with sex, and then your mind can wander, and therefore you defile yourself, defeating the purpose of prayer and fasting. Good points, good points, good points. So you get it now? I, I got it. And the only thing is, and I'm sure I would have to use, would I have to, let's say, 
he's going to say, I'm anticipating, I know what he's going to ask me. He's going to say, well, show him where it says it's a sin. But by showing him that it's contrary to the New Testament, by default, it would be a sin. Yes, yeah, so you mean I need to spell things black and white? Well, then show me in the New Testament, black and white, where a man can have multiple wives, and it's not sin. Flip it back on him. That's true. So you're making the assertion I can have multiple wives. Okay, show me a New Testament where it says you can have multiple wives and it's not sin. It's not adultery. You don't flip it on me. You're the one who made that made the claim, right? Yeah. So that's the whole point. The New Testament interprets the Old Testament. The Old Testament is subject to the New Testament. And in light of the Lord's own words, Jesus, who gave the law to Moses, Jesus said, Moses allowed you to divorce because of your stubborn, evil hearts. God in his mercy stooped down to your level and allowed and made this concession for something that to God is less than the ideal good for marriage. But now I'm going to elevate you and restore that ideal standard of marriage. We're not going to put up with this anymore. We did it for a season, but now things go back to the way they were before the fall. And that would be a point. What you're mentioning would be a point I would use in terms of, if, since Jesus is talking about that in terms of marriage, and specifically divorce, I can say that same point in terms of polygamy as well, that he tolerated for a season. Of course. Well, because what's his point? One husband, brother, he just said one male, one female. That was the point. He quoted Genesis 127 and Genesis 2, 24. He made them male and female. And he said the two become one flesh. He didn't say the three and four. That was right there. Yeah, it's right there. Sure. Now, when did polygyny start? When did this act of marrying multiple women began? Was it with uh, Noah or Moses? No. Before that. Anyone guess? When did Let the me. first acts of polygyny, marrying multiple women, began? Anybody know? Let's see. How many? Lamech? I can't pronounce that person's name. Yeah, it's Lamech from the cursed seed of Cain, none of what? which survived. Mm-hmm. So you notice polygyny, multiple wives, started among Lemech, a murderer who had murdered a man, right? He married more than one woman. So that polygyny started from an accursed line, a line tainted, cursed, the line of Cain who belongs to Satan, the evil one. Mm. You get my point? Yes. So they're arguing for polygyny, something that began from the accursed line of Cain, who belongs to the evil one. First John chapter 3, verse 12. What does it say there? And Cain was of the evil one, right? Yes. And yet polygyny started from his cursed line, because one of his cursed seed descendants, Lemech, who was a murderer, he's the one who married more than one woman. And that line was totally destroyed in the flood. So mm. even the origin, the root of polygyny is bad. It began, it sprung from cursed seed, evil satanic seed. Mm. Everyone got it, right? And what yes, does 1 John 3, 12 say? It, Read it, for me, 1 John. It, you would say that God tolerated due to the stubbornness yeah. of the Israelites. Yeah. Read 1 oh. John 3, verse 12. What does it say there about Cain? Because Lemek is from the seed of Cain, and that line was destroyed. You said John 3? 1 John 3, 12. 1 John 3, 12. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. So, and why? Now, mm -hmm. my question before you finish it, this is the cursed satanic seed. Cain is of the evil one, and his descendants are cursed because for they're from the seed of Satan, of the, the serpent, and this cursed seed of Cain, Lamech, introduces polygyny. Finish the verse. And it says, and why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. There you go. So this is the origin of polygyny. But who originated monogamy? God. God originated monogamy. 
one male, one female, the two, not the three or four, become one flesh. So do you want God's ideal for marriage? Or do you want to look to the Old Testament, the Mosaic Covenant, which was a covenant that wasn't based on God's ideal standard of how the righteous should live? Because God made a lot of concessions and allowances because his people were too wicked, too stubborn, too sinful for them to live up to God's perfect ideal standard. Even that standard, they failed miserably, bringing God's judgment. So it had to await the Lord Jesus, his incarnation, his death and resurrection. And now, by the Holy Spirit filling the church, he elevates us to meet that standard. So instead Amen. of him coming down to our level, he elevates us to his level. Amen. 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 So that's I the, definitely that, appreciate that. And the, and the debate is over, buddy. That's it. I mean, there's really nothing he's going to say. He's going to tap dance around it.